Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 313, Retreat to Bataan. Last time, we watched as the Japanese 48th Division continued coming down south from Lingayen Gulf, all the while applying pressure to General Wainwright's Filipino and American forces. Then the overall situation got worse with the landings of the Japanese 16th Division on Christmas Eve in Lamon Bay, to the southeast of Manila. The battle there went as well for the Japanese as it had in the north. Of course, there were no large guns to help hold back the invaders in the south, as they were all kept on the west coast to stop any landings there. To let troops land there would have meant for them a relatively easy drive north to Manila. But General Homa wanted the Japanese 16th to come ashore in the east to cut off Allied troops further south. Either way, the 16th had landed and so began to push west and north as they made their way to the main roads. And on Luzon, all roads led to Manila. However, as well as the overall campaign was going for General Homa, he knew that as long as the Allies held out on Bataan, Manila Bay, just east and south of the peninsula, was threatened enough to negate its use for future nearby invasions. As for that Allied naval threat, when Admiral Thomas C. Hart left the Philippines, he put in his stead Admiral Francis Rockwell, who now was in command of a regiment of Marines, three gunboats, three minesweepers, and six motor torpedo boats, and they would see action during the Battle of Bataan. For now, Hart's instructions to Rockwell was that the naval base at Cavite, another peninsula, this one six miles to the southwest of Manila, was to be abandoned and all excess fuel destroyed, along with any other useful supplies that could not be carried away. As for what few remaining fighters and bombers were still on Luzon, they were now under Colonel Harold H. George. But in a very short time, these pilots and their crews would become infantrymen, as there were soon to be no planes left to fly, repair, or protect. General Wainwright was using Plan Orange for the defense of Manila and his retreat to Bataan. First, he had to keep Route 7 that went into Bataan open, also where Route 7 intersected with Route 3 at San Fernando about 35 miles northwest of Manila, just below Fort Stassenberg. And it would be Route 3 that connected Manila and San Fernando that the southern Allied troops would be using to rush north to reach Bataan. To give time for troops and supplies to reach Bataan and Corregidor, Wainwright would set up five defensive lines in the Luzon Central Plain that led to Manila with D-1 being the most north, just below Lingay and Gulf, and the last, D-5, right above Fort Stassenberg, for the territory below the fort was needed for the transferring of troops and supplies. In theory, these defensive lines, which were to be held only long enough until truly challenged, were to gain time. Indeed, gaining time when employing this tactic was more important than inflicting casualties on the enemy. In keeping with this, when the first line fell, the men of that line would run back to the second line, and the defensive fighting would start all over again, and so forth. Unfortunately, this is one of the most complicated maneuvers for an army to do, and the Filipino troops were not that well trained, nor had they practiced this maneuver, specifically as MacArthur had altered the plan for the fighting to take place along the beaches. Still, between the American officers and the determination of the local troops, this series of complex retreats would be pulled off admirably. And in that process, the Filipino troops and General Wainwright would deliver to the general a few small miracles. But back to the maneuvers. Here's a taste of what was supposed to happen on paper. Though, in truth was, during the last few days of December and into early January, it was a bit messier on the ground. 
The defensive forces would have three designations, a security force that gathered intelligence, the main body, which is placed in areas most likely to be approached by the enemy within a given area of operations, and a reserve. Of course, this area of operations is rather small, as there were to be five lines in the central Luzon plain. But even then, of the security force and main body, some units were designated offensive, while others defensive. The offensive units, or primary positions, were ready to take the fight to the enemy, while supplemental positions were well placed for defense, in areas the enemy was less likely to come. But this also meant that the primary units had their flanks protected by the supplemental positions. Already picked out were fallback positions for all of these groups for each line, but again, the integrity of the formation had to be maintained. So, the fallback would be orderly, one unit at a time, while the rest offered defensive fire. This allows movement of various units versus focusing on inflicting casualties. And to keep the enemy honest with each retreat, a small detachment of infantry and artillery would leave last, just to keep an eye on things. But as this was a battle, a science that had been studied, analyzed, practiced, and put into use for thousands of years, it gets even more detailed. There is a delay line, a trigger line, and a disengagement line. The delay line is a line that headquarters has determined the enemy shall not be allowed to pass until a certain time and day, normally until the other positions behind this line have been put into place. The trigger line is a line that runs through the engagement area in such a way that when the enemy reaches it, this will trigger a mass reaction from lead elements, such as fire at will, until the enemy's advance is stopped. Lastly, the disengagement line. Like it sounds, it is a line that once it is crossed, the various units will retreat back to the next pre-established defensive position to start all over again. The idea is for focused, limited fire to stop the enemy from scoring a breakout, all the while eating up time for some larger purpose. Also, to avoid casualties by friendly fire. It's important to keep in mind that all this mentioned is to keep the overall force from becoming too deeply engaged. And it gets even more complicated with successive and or alternate positions, but the point has been made. The true science of warfare would not truly be used by the locals. Instead, guts and determination would be the basis that this Battle of Manila would be fought. Meanwhile, during all of this, the southern Luzon force would use Route 3, go past the capital, cross the bridges at Calumpit, just below San Fernando, and when at that city, turn left or south, now on Route 7, to make for Bataan, where the other defensive lines were already being established. So the northern troops would fight for time, while the southern forces were told, in no uncertain terms, that they had until January 8th to reach Bataan. After that, no promises were made. The five D-lines had been scouted out years ago, and each one was tied to a natural barrier, a river or a height, to give the defenders the best chance of success. Basically, each line was one night's march away from the next line, which tied in with the overall plan that each line was meant to hold out for only a single day. Also factored into this, the central Luzon plain was simply too wide for the available forces to properly defend. As for Brigadier General James Weaver's provisional tank group, they would focus their turrets on turns in a road or in a place that had a narrow view, positioning themselves on both sides of the road to maximize their firepower. This also kept their own escape route open. Again, the idea was to delay always gaining time for the retreating infantry around them. Engineers, mostly from the 91st Philippine Division, 
would be responsible for the roads and bridges just ahead of the forces falling back, as in they made sure they were passable for their comrades and then impassable for the enemy. But working against this solid, long-thought-out retreat and defense plan was that the enemy completely controlled the skies, and as stated, the planners were attempting to supply the troops fighting on the five defensive lines that were practically always on the move, while simultaneously supplying Baton and Corregidor. This would directly affect the supplies for the men attempting to hold back the Japanese in the north. On December 24th, in the afternoon, the North Luzon force was positioned on the D-1 line, just below the southern end of Lingayen Gulf. Positioned from Erdanata on the east side of the central plain to San Carlos in the relative center, and ending at Aguilar, furthest west, on Route 13. Per the plan, they were to hold out until 1900 hours, or 7 p.m., then fall back to the Agno River, which is where we left the North Luzon force previously. However, the 26th Cavalry had already fallen back across the Agno to Tayug, on the eastern edge of the plain. This town marked the far right flank of the D2 line. Besides resting from their fighting since the enemy had landed, it is a military maxim to have a mobile force on the flank to either help stymie the enemy or take advantage of any mistakes they might make. In the center of the defensive D-1 line was the 11th Philippine Division with the 192nd Tank Battalion acting as an anchor for the entire line, and hopefully more tanks from the 194th coming from Manila would arrive soon, which left the left or west flank. There, the 21st Philippine Division would take position. These were the freshest troops as they had yet to face the Japanese. To their left was the Zambalese Mountains, hence no threat was expected from that direction. As his forces reached the D-1 line, General Homa could feel that his men were facing something different here, something different than before. The enemy seemed more organized and determined, this could not stand. Although General Homa could not know that this current line, the D-1, was the first of five specific lines, his real concern was a bit further south, along the Agno River, the Allies' D-2 line. That would be a more formidable position, as opposed to what his men were facing now. So instead of hitting the enemy along the entire line, he would consolidate his forces and then hit in two specific places when he got to the Agno. The 9th Reconnaissance and the 1st Formosa regiments were put together and told to hit San Carlos, just left of center of the D-2 line, when the time came. There, they would be going up against the Philippine 11th Division. This left the rest of the 48th Division to hit the 26th Cavalry Regiment at Tayug on the far Allied right flank, who were already at the D-2 position. Again, not knowing the Allied plan, Homo would, fortunately for him, negate the D-1 line by going after the 26th Cavalry already on the right end of the D-2 line. Homo wanted the enemy cavalry unit slapped around enough by his infantry and artillery to then allow some of his tanks to get past them unencumbered. Once this happened, he knew the enemy would retreat from Tayug, and prudence would demand that the rest of the line follow suit. Indeed, if all went perfectly, his tanks would not be stopped and they would be able to push on south on Route 5, to capture, or even better, get past the Filipino infantry. And if that happened, the race was on. Again, it would all have to break his way, but it was possible that Homa's tanks could travel down Route 5 and then turn up Route 3 to take the bridges at Callum Pit, which the Allies desperately needed to get all troops to Bataan. This battle, nay, the entire war, could end 
right here. Sure enough, the men of the trusty 48th Division went in, and though taking losses, started pushing back the horsemen. The 26th Cavalry radioed to headquarters of their worsening situation, but they were told to hold out a little longer, which the 26th somehow did. The first miracle for Wainwright and MacArthur. As the fighting was not going well on the right flank, at 1900 hours, as planned, Wainwright ordered the 19th Division, already along the Agno, to begin to blow the bridges there, and then position themselves behind the D2 line. As for the far Allied right flank, not until noon the next day, December 25th, was the 26th Cavalry deemed sufficiently softened up to send forward the advance armored element of the Japanese 28th Reconnaissance Regiment. Such was the fierceness of the horsemen, whereas General Homa would have preferred that they had been wiped out the first day. Either way, as bravely as the Philippine horsemen had fought, the battle here was over. The 26th retreated. By 0400 of December 26th, Taiyu was taken by the Japanese. Still, as the Allied right had not folded in on itself or allowed itself to be smashed, it was General Homa's plan of a mad dash south that was smashed. With D-2 no longer being defensible, this allowed the larger nearby Japanese unit, the 48th Division, to cross the Agno that afternoon at 1800, near Villasis, just right of center, on December 26th. With this breach, later that afternoon, Wainwright ordered the 11th Division to head down Route 3 to the D3 line. On that same day, December 26th, MacArthur declared Manila an open city. General MacArthur, Commander in Chief of the United States Armed Forces in the Far East, announced, to spare the capital from the ravages of war, I have today declared Manila as an open city. To avoid every possible danger, the Office of the American High Commissioner, the Commonwealth Government, and Army Headquarters will immediately evacuate the city of Manila and the special districts around it. It would take a few more days, but by the last day of December, Manila would be free of Allied troops. It was truly at this point that Homa realized he would have to make his way to Bataan to finish off the Allied troops and finish this battle. But making it a bit harder, as Manila had been abandoned, the Japanese would have to occupy and administer the capital city, for it could not be left to the locals who would strip it clean. But first things first. For now, San Fernando, the connecting city of Routes 3 from Manila and Route 7, which headed down into the peninsula, had to be captured to stop the flow of enemy troops and supplies reaching Bataan. But the Japanese weren't there yet. Probably from sheer exhaustion, the Japanese did not attack D-3, on December 27th, settling instead for simple probing attacks, which suited MacArthur and Wainwright just fine. Still, the defenders readied themselves to fall back to the D-4 line. That afternoon of the 27th, on the far right, the Philippine 91st Division left the D-3 line at 1730. By 0430 of December 28th, the Philippine 91st was now along the right side of the D-4, just below Cabanatuan, just south of the Papanga River. Now on Route 5, this was their road to guard. With the right flank of D-4 now anchored, their brother units abandoned D-3 and fell back to D-4. Wainwright now became concerned that he and his were falling back a bit too fast, not giving the southern Luzon force enough time. To rectify this, he ordered that D-4 be held longer than planned for. Reorganizing themselves, which took time, only on December 29th did the Japanese 48th Division reach the D-4 line. It came at the D-4 in two columns. One column, made up of the 1st Formosa Regiment with a battalion of artillery, went towards Cabanatuan on the Allied right flank 
the other column comprising the 2nd Formosa Regiment, the 47th Infantry Regiment, and the 48th Reconnaissance Regiment, went to Tarlac, now left of center of the D4 line, just west of Cambanatuan. And there, this force was augmented by the arrival of the 9th Infantry Regiment, giving this force an impressive array of options in firepower and numbers. Indeed, General Homa threw this outsized force at the center of the line, hoping to snap it in two. However, the American and Filipino forces held out on December 30th on the D4 line. Another miracle for the cause. Having done their job that day, Wainwright's forces withdrew that night and by dawn of December 31st were now set up along the D5 line. This line was along Fort Stotzenberg on the Allied far left and went east to Sybil Springs. So far, Route 3 on the Allied left flank and Route 5 on the right flank was still in possession of the defenders. Just behind the D5 line at San Fernando, the South Luzon force finally arrived. They would assist in holding the vital San Fernando Junction and some of the territory just north of it, as this meant that Allied troops from Manila and further south could still safely travel past the capital, go across the Calumput bridges, and then to Route 7 to reach Bataan. Unfortunately, at this time, the route just below San Fernando and along Route 7 became jammed with all these Allied troops and vehicles heading in the same direction. Here was a perfect opportunity for Japanese air power to obliterate the slow or at times non-moving column of tanks and trucks. But for whatever reason, this did not happen. Wainwright and MacArthur were grateful, to say the least. With this reprieve from the god of war, the southern Luzon group made its way to Bataan. By New Year's Day, all were safely within the peninsula. It was at this point that Wainwright's forces themselves began their trip to Bataan, which meant pulling back from the D-5 line. This allowed some of the tanks of the Japanese 7th Tank Regiment on their left flank, the Allied right, to reach Baliag on December 31st, well past the D-5 line. This position also put them just east by northeast of the Kalimput Bridges. As for the bridges just north of Daliag, they had recently been destroyed, but the Japanese still found a way across the river there. The Japanese infantry stopped at Daliag to fix the bridge, but a group of tanks from the Sonona force continued on. Soon they were close enough to threaten the route over the Kalimput bridges. Yet before the clash of armor at Kalimput, Wainwright was displeased that Baliag had given up so quickly, so he sent back two tank platoons and six half-tracks. They entered the city from the east, while local troops fired artillery shells at the enemy. This allowed these light tanks to get in closer, unharassed. At 5 p.m. that day, the American armor drove into the enemy, pushing them back, taking out eight enemy tanks without losing any themselves. This successful counterattack allowed the Filipino infantry further south more time to safely get across the Kalimput bridges to the west, though they were also being threatened. Yet another miraculous outcome, though orchestrated by tried-and-true methods of warfare. Back to Kalimput, as the Japanese tanks approached, also in the area was C Company, 192nd Tank Battalion. The American Steward light tanks came out of the town, hoping to reach the enemy before they got close enough to take aim at the nearby bridges. As the two sides clashed, the American tank's main gun, a 37mm gun, started firing at the enemy armor. The 95 Ha Go light tanks, who were also equipped with a 37 millimeter gun. However, the Japanese versions were not designed to duel other tanks, but rather support their infantry. Before too long, this battleground 
belonged to the American Stuarts. With this local victory, more time was bought. The next day, New Year's Day, the last of the southern Luzon force had passed this threatened area by and into Bataan. With the D-5 line all but abandoned, the North Luzon force, now responsible for a smaller front, held off the ever-determined Japanese. Their goal now was to keep San Fernando in Allied hands, allowing their troops to make for the peninsula. On January 2nd, the new Allied defensive line was now south of San Fernando. Now, the goal wasn't to allow troops and supplies to make their way to Bataan. That had already happened, but rather to give those troops there time to set up their dispositions. For the first few days of the new year, the Japanese 48th Division pounded on the Philippine 11th and 21st Divisions, but these men would not give up. However, from January 1st to the 6th, it was Wainwright's plan for the 11th and 21st Divisions to move back as they fought, and this they did splendidly. Demonstrating this, on January 5th, the Tanaka Detachment tried to take the town of Gagao, about 12 miles from the top of Bataan. Early that morning, before the sun appeared, a Japanese favorite tactic, the detachment charged across an open field, hoping to surprise the Filipinos. Instead, expecting something like this, the defenders opened up with their artillery, while their comrades covered the guns. The first charge was stopped, as was the second, and third. By the time the attackers gave up, the Tanaka detachment was no longer an effective unit. And in this way, Wainwright's rear guard forces pulled back to Layek at the top of the peninsula to a single bridge across the Kutu River. There, the redoubtable 26th Cavalry, parts of the 11th Philippine and 21st Divisions, with a few tanks, held up the Japanese while the rest of the North Luzon force crossed into the peninsula. Being one of the first to engage the enemy, as well as being one of the last, on January 7th at 7 a.m., the 26th Cavalry crossed the Kutu River into Bataan. The bridge was then blown. General Homa now completely controlled central Luzon. But now, Operation 1 the major plan of the Japanese Imperial Army staff to take what they wanted in the Southeast Pacific came to inflict its own casualty, that being General Homa. It had been decided previously that on a set day, the vaunted 48th Division would leave the Philippines and help with the invasion of the Netherlands' East Indies, and that day had just come. Like that, Homa had lost his best division. He would now have to rely on the 16th Division, which had come ashore at Lamon Bay, but again were not respected as a fighting force, and the 65th Independent Mixed Brigade. The 65th was a unit of mobilized reservists, appropriate for occupation duties only. To balance this out, MacArthur had lost about 13,000 troops so far, though some of those had been desertions. Still, it was possible for Homa to achieve his goal of victory within the 50-day timetable. For now, the victor of Luzon settled himself into Manila and asked, how much fight do the defenders still have in them? Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Sorry for the background noise during this, but I have been kicked out of my office because some deem that a child's education is more important than this podcast. I think we all know the truth. Anyway, I just wanted to uh, thank some new members and uh, say hi and thank you very much to those who have recently donated. So the first member that I'd like to say hi to is Louis Berrios from Jacksonville, Florida, Mark Ferris from Madison, Alabama, <laughs> Dylan Porter, um, St. John's, Newfoundland. And as far as those who have donated recently, there's Douglas Forbes, Robert Graydon, and, and Ken Jacob. 
and Ken Jacob. Good job. Thank you. So again, thank you for uh, keeping the show afloat and as well as my hobbies and habits. Some are healthy, some are not, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, so uh, we'll see you as soon as we can with the next episode. Take Take care, care. everyone. (laughs) That's my line.